Well, good evening, everyone. I see that it is 6.30. So Brother Mike asked me to uh, bring the message tonight, and uh, I've got a question. How many remember what I talked about last time? Anybody? That's what I thought. I didn't either. Be ready. We've got to be ready, okay? So we've got to be ready. So one of the things that I'm... uh, that, that's really burdened in my heart right now is a group of people who believe they are saved, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, I'm not the judge, and I will not be the judge, and neither will you. So we can't say someone is saved or not saved. That's not our job. But a lot of times we see the fruits or don't see the fruits of that salvation. They have the head knowledge, and as Brother Mike says, they're about this far from salvation. They've got the knowledge, but they don't have it in their heart. And that bothers me. I am, I am concerned for the lost. I really am. But I'm really concerned for those people who think they are. Because Satan, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, is deception. And he's good at it. He's really good at it. So I want to talk about uh, deception a little bit tonight. So we've ar- I've, already, I've already given you the answer, so you can answer it back. Who deceives us today? Satan does, right? How many of us have actually had Satan tempt us or deceive us directly? I'm willing to bet not very many. So is it just him? that deceives us? Or does he have demons that will be able to deceive you as well? And we're going to look into that. So uh, Satan himself does deceive and does try to tempt us, right? Look what he did to Eve in the garden. Genesis 3.5 tells us that Satan deceived Eve. What about when Satan tried to deceive Christ by misquoting scriptures and tempted him in the wilderness. That was Satan. However, 2 Corinthians tells us Satan masquerades about like an angel of light, and so does his servants. So Satan actually has servants, and they are masquerading around as light. And we know the difference between light and dark, right? Light is God, dark is Satan. But they pretend to be light. And that's where we have to be on guard. We must be on guard. Turn with me to Psalms 36. Psalms 36. Now I'm going to give you a little thing here that should kind of make you a little concerned. This is a Psalm of David. It says, An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. So he's concerned about the wicked individuals around him in that day. Do we have any wicked individuals around us today? And the answer to that is yes. Everywhere, right? Everywhere. But look at what the wicked does. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Do we see that today? Do we see people have no fear of God? I'll be honest. The fear of God is what got me saved. I was absolutely terrified. I knew I was going to hell, and I did not want to go. And so I looked, and tried, I started reading the Bible, and like, I'm, I'm going. How do I get out of this? And then it took me a while, because I'm a slow learner, that Jesus loved me so much, He died for me. I'm like, why would He die for me? That doesn't make any sense. But I finally accepted, and now I can see fully what He has done for me. So there is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. What does that mean? He flatters himself in his own eyes. Does anybody pat themselves on the back? Well, I've got people at work, they do that all the time. And I'm like, just, it doesn't matter. You did a good job, thanks, move on. Let's, let's, let's keep doing what's right and not do it for what I can get out of it, Right? That's not what this is talking about, though. This person is not patting himself on the back. When he finds out his iniquity and he hates, 
he flatters himself in his own eyes. This is like a somebody that's done something evil and said, Woohoo, look what I've done. I'm just a bad man, right? I'm, I'm so bad. That's not taking God or having any fear in God. Look at verse 3. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to be good. Do we know any around that are like that today? Probably. Verse 4, he, deceives, he devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. That's talking about the wicked. What I want to talk about is us and how we can be self-deceptive. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I love reading the book of James. And I also do not like reading the book of James. Because James is very hard hitting. James pulls no punches. James tells it like it is and what we need to be doing. And he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We most, most of us has probably heard that we have two ears for a reason. We're supposed to hear twice as much as we speak. And I haven't quite caught on to that because you can ask Christine. I, I talk a lot. Um, but we need to be about listening to others. And that's something that I've been trying to do more and more of is listen to them and see where they're at in their journey. Are they at the very beginning? They just got saved? Have they been saved for a long time? Or are they one of those that has the right answers, but they're not on a journey at all? That's where my heart is. That's where I, I am trying to focus my efforts. Don't get me wrong, I will witness to somebody that is lost that don't know. But honestly, they're a whole lot easier to witness to than somebody that thinks they're saved and are not. Look in verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. How did I get saved? Was it somebody that taught me? No. Was, was, what was it? It was this right here. I read this. God opened my eyes and I was saved. It was the word, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So these individuals that I've been dealing with, how are they going to get saved? It's not me talking to them. It's me getting them in the Word. That's where we've got to be about. Making sure we're in the Word. But be doers, 22, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I knew a guy who knew the Bible better than I did. He could quote things that I, I'm like, that's in there? I'd have to look it up. I had no clue. But you know what he believed what was going to happen when he died? He's just going to be turned into dirt. It's no big deal. He had the Word. He, he's read the Word. He knew more than I did. He just didn't put it in his heart. I worked with that man for almost 17 years. And I tried to talk to him. Never got through that I know of. I haven't seen him in probably, probably 10 years. I don't know. I don't know if I got through. But I can tell you for 17 years, I'm guaranteeing I know I didn't get through then. I don't know if something I said made a difference. I don't know but it's the Word that's going to make a difference. But we can have the Word, we can read it, and we can still deceive ourselves if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to use it in our lives. Verse 23, it says, For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, 
goes away and immediately forgets of what kind of a man he was. We can fool ourselves. So at the base, in one of my previous jobs, one of the things I had to do is justify how we spent money. I'm pretty good at justifying spending money. So I had some money that was set aside for this type of mission. But another unit needed some of the money. And so... What they were doing allowed us to do this mission, so I justified by spending the money for them to work for us. I can justify things. I can justify things all day long. But how many of us justify sin? Oh, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Oh, well, everybody's doing it. Oh, well, it's just a little thing. Well, nobody else knows. I have to be very careful because I'm very good at justifying. And I do not want to justify sin. We have to be about being doers of the Word. If you want to know what to do and how to do things, it's right here. I know it's a lot. I know it's a big book. But there's ways you can look stuff up. There's apps. There's all kinds of cool things now. I know some people don't like computers. But there, you can get in and you can find things and research things and there's all kinds of stuff right at your fingertips. We have absolutely no reason, absolutely no reason that we can justify sin. None. Because we have God's Word. And we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Brother Mike says all the time when something slips out of his mouth and the first thing he says is, I shouldn't have said that. But that's the Holy Spirit going, guess what? You messed up. We have to acknowledge that fact. We have to, when we realize we've messed up, confess it, apologize for it, ask God to forgive us, and move on. But how many of us do not do those things? Unfortunately, I'm willing to bet it's several. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Start in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean I don't sin. Now, granted, I don't have to. I have the Holy Spirit. I don't have to sin. Once I'm saved, I could never sin again. But probably I'm going to choose to unfortunately, because of my flesh. But it says, who, what does the blood of Jesus Christ do? Cleanse us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. I can sit here and read this all day long. I can memorize it. But if I don't put it in my heart and put it into practice, I am deceiving myself. I can say, every one of us, if I ask you certain questions, you're going to know exactly what the answer should be. But too often, as I tell everybody at the base, we don't give open and honest feedback. We do not honestly tell each other the honest truth. Because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, or we don't want to make somebody mad, or we don't. But honestly, if we're open and honest, let me ask you a question. When somebody goes up, hey, how are you doing today? What is your response? I'm okay. I'm doing good. Whether you are or not. 
So when I was in Afghanistan and we had a mortar attack happen, and I wasn't allowed to tell people about my faith unless they asked, God's got a sense of humor. Because during that mortar attack, I got to tell everybody why I wasn't nervous. Well, let me tell you exactly why I'm not nervous. Because I know where I'm going. If something happens to me, it's okay. I'm not afraid to die. Why? Because Jesus Christ saved my soul and I'm going to heaven. Isn't that an awesome thing? Open and honest communication. God will give you opportunities to tell about your story and how God's helped you through something. You know why? Because He wants others to have that same saving faith as you. That's where we need to be. Using God's Word to help others see who He truly is. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Told you James was hard-hitting. I think Paul's pretty hard-hitting right here. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And such was I. I'm guilty. Some of these I didn't do. Doesn't it say, if you broke one law, you have broke them all? All have come in short of the glory of God, right? Some of us were some of these things. But look at the rest of verse 11. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Folks, that should make us jump up and down. I am saved and I'm going to heaven, and I know that. And I lost my mom a couple weeks ago. I'm sad, but I'm rejoicing. Because I know where she's at. Because she had that saving faith. Everybody goes, well, how do you know? You can't, you, you're not the judge. You're right. But I'm telling you, my mom was a fearful of water. The bathtub never got over an inch deep when she took a bath. She was terrified of water. Would not get near it anywhere. Would not get in a boat. She was not getting near water. When she asked me to go to her baptism, I'm like, Mom, you know they're going to dunk you, right? And she's like, I got to. I'm like, why? She goes, Jesus told me to. So I know where she's at. But as you can see, what we used to be and how we can use the Word to help us we can also fool ourselves. So we have to take a closer look of ourselves and be open and honest with us and open and honest with God. By the way, God already knows. You're not fooling Him. Well, nobody else knows. I can have a sin in my life and nobody else on this planet has a clue. God knows. So who am I trying to fool? I'm trying to deceive myself and make myself feel better. Trust me, after you've asked for forgiveness and you've confessed and you've taken care of this, you will feel much better. Much, much better. I can remember the night I was saved because I was truly worried about going to hell. I was fearful. And rightfully so, I should have been. But that night, the peace that passes understanding... I didn't understand all these Bible terms and all this stuff. But I'm telling you, I couldn't explain it. I could not explain how I felt. It was incredible. 
And I look back on it today, and I'm thinking, and he's allowed me to continue on. Now, there's times I'm like, go ahead. I'm ready to go. Take me on home. I'm ready. I'm right, Brother Mike. I'm, I ain't afraid. I'm, I'm ready to go. But I've also had the Holy Spirit speak to me, not audibly, but speak to me and say, kind of being selfish. Look around you and how many are not ready to go. And what are you doing about it? I don't want to deceive myself into thinking that everybody else is okay just because they say they are. I want to know that they're okay. I want to know. So I've said all of that to say this. Let's go to John, uh, for, uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, am I going to do that every single time? No. I'm going to choose something wrong, most likely. But if I love him, I will do my utmost best to do what he's asked me to do. But look at what he does for us. Verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. What does the word forever mean? It means forever. Never ending. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me for ever. Now, whether I listen to him or not is my choice, but he's there giving me a way out. When I'm tempted, there will be a way out. I just have to choose it. But folks, the Holy Spirit is a spring that never, ever runs dry. I'm telling you, it's dry out there right now, is it not? Holy Spirit never, ever, ever runs dry. Verse 17, And the Spirit of truth to whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. Understand, Jesus hasn't went to the cross yet. And he says, because I live, you will also live. He's still alive today, folks. Yes, he died on the cross for three days. And after that, what a glorious time. I can't even imagine what heaven was like when he got to be, come home. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when I get to go home. You know, the song I can only imagine. I got a pretty good imagination, but I can't even imagine. I don't know what it's going to be like. I can tell Brother Steve, I'm going to be singing like crazy up there. And nobody's going to go, shh. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. He who has my commands, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And he will love him and make our, we will come to him and make our homes with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which 
you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Folks, he went to prepare a place, and he's coming again. Now, I'm with Brother Mike. I think we're going to be out of here before he comes. But then, if we're out of here, when he comes, we're coming back with him. I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm starting to look at things into the future of things where, where our country's headed, um, where things are going. And I'm looking forward to that coming. I can't wait for him to get here. But in the meantime, there are people who I have influence over that I need to make sure they're ready as well. And I think we all have those. Don't deceive yourselves not only on your own sin, but don't deceive yourselves on thinking somebody's okay just because they have the right answer to one question or another question. Make sure they know. It's a hard conversation to go up to a loved one and say, you know what, are you really saved? Can you, you know, have that hard conversation? It's just like at work. It's hard to go up to an individual and say, you know what, you're not cutting it. I need you to do better. I, it's hard to have those kinds of conversations because we don't like conflict. Folks, we're in a battle. I talked about it before. We've got to be ready because Satan is raging. If you don't believe me, look at the news. Things are going south quickly. Let's go on to verse 27. Peace I leave with you. Folks, that right there tells me I'm saved. Because I'm not afraid to die. I am not. I know where I'm going. I know in 1991, it's a very long time ago, I was terrified. I was terrified to die. Now, I did some pretty stupid stuff that I probably shouldn't be here anyway, but I was terrified about death. But I am no longer. Because His peace He gave me because I know for a fact that He saved me. His blood saved me. It says, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Folks, don't be afraid. There is absolutely nothing in this world that I'm afraid of. Don't like snakes? Tell you up front. A little skittish around them, but I can take care of them. I got a shovel. Um, but I'm not afraid. I haven't counted it myself, but it says... Some people say there's 365 times in the Bible that says, do not be afraid. It's one for every day of the year. Not afraid of COVID. Not afraid of dying. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to walk out in front of a truck or anything. I don't have a death wish like Brother Mike says, but I ain't afraid. I am not afraid. You have heard to me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. This is verse 28. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it comes to pass, you may believe. Do you believe? Wednesday night, probably get most of you to say yes, if not all of you. But my question is to you tonight, is there something that the Holy Spirit's nagging at you about? Is there something there that you haven't been open and honest with God and yourself? Maybe. Is there somebody that you need to go to that you know that's not saved or you're questioning whether they are or not? There will be divine appointments that God will give you 
if you are looking for them. Things happen all the time. And people go, oh, that's just a coincidence. No. No. God put a lot of people in my path before I got saved to get me saved. Are you one of those in somebody's path? If you are, open your eyes and open your mouth and start talking. Would you stand? Please stand. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just praise you and honor you for who you are. You are such a gracious God that you even saved a wretch like me. And Lord, I'd uh, like to take this time to just praise you and honor you for who you are, what you've done since your son on the cross. I'd like to ask Brother Steve to come up and I want to sing a song after this, but Lord, I just uh, I want to give you glory and honor. Because Isaiah 43, 7 tells us that we are created for your glory. I'm not here for my own sake. I'm not here for my own glory. Whenever I'm given an accolade, I have to turn it back to you because you're the one that gave me the ability to whatever I've done. You're the one that gives me the words. It's your Holy Spirit in me that, that allows me to understand what your word really means to me now. And Lord, I just again, I just praise you and honor you I ask that you'd be with each and every one here tonight, everyone listening online. I just ask that they would truly open their heart to you, that if there's some kind of deception going on, Lord, and I bind Satan right now and his demons, I allow the Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of these hearts. I ask that you would be in them, guide them and direct them in everything that we do. And Lord, whatever happens throughout this rest of this week, that we have those divine appointments that you've created and we witness them and we go into them full force and we allow people to see who you are through us. Lord, again, I don't know why you use us, but you do. And Lord, I just ask that you'd be with us, guide and direct us in everything that we do, and we will give you glory, honor, and praise. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.